welcome everybody here. I guess we could almost say this is our uh, Hurricane Watch Bible study. And we'll get into what we announced last week that we would do after we finish John. And that is get into the second writing of Luke, which I personally think was a continuation of where he left off after he wrote about the life of Christ evidence to prove to Theophilus that Jesus Christ was who he claimed to be. I'm going to follow the same approach I have in the study of the book that I did with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Again, we're in what is called now the historical section of the New Testament. It's the only book we would place in that category. And it has the history of the church in the first century from about AD 30 to uh, somewhere in the early 80s, 60s. Now, you won't find a history written like this any other way in the New Testament regarding the church. The closest you can read about the church later on in the first century would be the book of Revelation written by John, which, if we're right, was written somewhere around 96. So we're reading about the beginning of the church and the first efforts in the very infant church to spread the gospel and the problems that arose within the church and without the church. And... Uh, We'll do, like I said before, uh, we'll look first of all at a key verse. And these are arbitrarily selected by me trying to, I guess you'd say, come up with a verse that sort of reflects the totality of what runs through, a thread that runs through the whole of the book. And if you look at Acts 1 and verse 8, uh, you'll see Jesus saying to the apostles after they've asked, Lord, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? And he says, it's not given to you know the time of Caesar which God's put in his own power, but ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses um, in both um, Jerusalem, Judea, uh, and Samaria, and the other most part of the earth. Now, the reason I say that's a, a good verse is because it pretty well sets out a very general outline of the whole book, because that's what they did. And let's remind ourselves that the apostles of Christ were the only witnesses in all that a witness can do of Christ that are officially selected by Christ to do the work that we read they did. Um, the idea of, of apostle, apostolos, or plural apostoloi, uh, is one sent out for a given purpose. That's the idea. So the word was used in the Greek among a lot of folks. If they were chosen and sent out to do something. So it was a word already used in the Koine Greek. The Holy Spirit took it and applied it to the apostles sent out by Christ, chosen for a purpose and sent out by Christ to accomplish that purpose. And same way with the uh, word for church, ek, klesia, which is a um, compound word. It was already being used for any assembly. If you had a assembly of parents or assembly of whatever, it would be an ekklesia. So these words were already in usage among the Greeks and the common Greek, the Koine Greek. And then the Holy Spirit had these people use them. So in verse 8, the apostles would receive power. When? When the Holy Spirit came upon them. It's at that point they will be qualified and enabled beyond their mere human ability to be witnesses starting in Jerusalem and then throughout Judea, where Jerusalem is located. Then you'll remember, as we'll see later, Philip going down to Samaria to preach the gospel. And then the rest of the book is dealing with 
basically Paul's work as the apostle to the Gentiles to spread the gospel to the Gentiles. Specifically, we'll say here, though we'll say more about it when we get there, uncircumcised Gentiles, because if you read the list that you find in Acts 2, where all these folks were from and who they were on the day of Pentecost that were there to hear the gospel preached when the apostles were baptized in the Holy Spirit, you'll find proselytes already listed or in the list. So there were Gentiles already with the Jews, but they were those that elected of themselves to take on the living of the law of Moses. So they were not considered by the devout Jew, the same as an uncircumcised Gentile, like Cornelius was. We'll say more about that later. So Jesus says, you are my witnesses. You are my witnesses. I go back and read. We just did it recently. John chapters 14, 15, and 16. And there you'll find what enabled the apostles to accomplish the task the Lord chose them to do. If you want to see the radical difference in them, Look at Peter, scared out of his wits, when the Lord was arrested, and how he denies the Lord. And yet, look at him a few days later, where all this had happened, after the apostles had been baptized with the Holy Spirit, Peter standing up with the leaven, right in the middle of Jerusalem, and begins to speak. And just a little later, you'll note that uh, the Sanhedrin, the chief priests and others, in Acts about Acts 4, after they had been arrested, after the healing of the lame man at Solomon's porch, took notice of the boldness of Peter and John, and that they had been with Jesus. There's a difference that the Holy Spirit baptism and the relationship the Holy Spirit had with them that they had had with Jesus made. So it, it was much, they had to be qualified. That's the reason that they didn't understand a lot of things, that they would be guided to understand. And we're told, you won't have to study. It'll be given you in that self-same hour, what you shall say. So they had that relationship with Christ through the Spirit, the parakletos relationship, which there's no one English word that can translate the full meaning of parakletos. The King James Version and others have chosen a comforter. I will I'll pray the Father and he will send you another parakletos, another comforter. But comforter is only one aspect of the relationship the Holy Spirit had with the apostles. And think of the relationship they had with Christ and his relationship with them. But to accomplish the work that uh, Christ called them to do, to be his witnesses, for they had been with him. And even Paul, as he said, as one born out of due season, was a witness of the resurrected Christ, and he received all that he taught by revelation of Jesus Christ. He makes that def uh, statement in defense of his apostleship in Galatians 1 to expose or refute the Judaizing teachers. He said, well, he's a, he's a Johnny come lately. He's really not an apostle. And Paul makes it clear, I didn't receive anything from the other apostles, but by revelation of Jesus Christ. So when you look at his conversion, which we're a little more detailed, we get to that point sometime down the road, Lord wills, then we will see that when Jesus appeared down to Nias, and Nias was scared of Paul, he says, I have shown him all the things that he must suffer. I will show him all those things. So you get the idea that there's this continual revelation with him, which would not be peculiar just to Paul, that was the work the Holy Spirit did with these apostles. I don't know how they would have stood what they stood if they had not had that kind of um, divine, miraculous, direct help from God. Uh, the devil, you might say, is throwing all that he has at the early church to destroy it. He thought he had accomplished his task when he had Jesus killed. The only thing he did was work right into the plans of God. So you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit's come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and on the uttermost part of the earth. 
probably say more about this later, but uh, we hear a lot of folks and have for many, many years among the denominations, some of our own brethren pick it up. I don't know any better because they're too ignorant of the Bible. And they say, let me give you my Christian witness. There is no such thing. I can tell you what Christ has done for me. And the Baptist will stand up and outdo me in telling you what Christ has done for him or her. The truth of the matter is Christ selected his witnesses, and I can't outdo Peter, James, John, and all the rest. Uh, for they were not only personally with him to give testimony as any human would in a witness, but they also had the baptismal measure of the Holy Spirit and the paracletus relationship to do what they did, and thus they were infallibly guided in the truth. If you go back and read John 14, 15, 16, you'll see how the emphasis is given to the Holy Spirit to work with the apostles as being the spirit of truth, because he fundamentally was revealing the New Testament. And the early church knew that because Acts 2 verse 42 says that they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Why? Because the Holy Spirit through them was delivering the will of Christ for them. They had no written New Testament, and that's the way they learned how the Lord wanted them to act. Now, the word witness is used over 30 times. I think I'm right on that. The third person of the Godhead, Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost, and his cognates are alluded to some 60 times. 60 times. The church at this time, from its beginning, for many years thereafter, had to have, it was imperative that it have direct guidance from God. First of all, the whole New Testament had to, had to be revealed, but it wasn't revealed all on the day of Pentecost during the next few years. Then it had to be written down, and that took some time to get it done. Well, then how are these people to know the Lord's will about proper worship, about the items of worship, and so on, how to live the Christian life? Well, they had the Holy Spirit in the apostles. And then we'll learn how they laid hands on people and imparted different miraculous gifts to the members of the church so that they can have that kind of guidance to cause them to be able to live as the Lord wanted them to live. But all the time this was happening, then, as Paul said in verse Corinthians 13, they were prophesying in part, and they knew in part. In other words, as something arose that they needed the will of the Lord delivered to them on, then it would be delivered to them. And I simply at this point say, uh, consider then the matter of how did the church learn that the uncircumcised Gentiles had a right to the gospel? We'll read Acts 10 to 11. But that was sometime after the church was established. So there were things going on in that infant stage of the church that would not be permitted to go on once the New Testament was fully revealed and written down. It was only at that time that uh, some things were tolerated as things were done. And I'll have more to say about that as we get on into the text. One of the key thoughts that I would emphasize here is what the Bible teaches about the importance of prayer, the power of prayer. Because if you look at each chapter of the books of Acts, the book of Acts, you'll see that it shows the results of the effectual fervent prayer of righteous men. And uh, most of those of the chapters of the book of Acts mentions prayer. And thus, uh, you might recall, the apostles knew much about the importance of that and by no other way than observing the life of Jesus. Well, how much does Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John reveal about in his life the time that he spent in prayer? Uh, what would be the key subject of the book of Acts? The Church of Christ. And I use that, as you hear me say many, many times, I use the term Church of Christ as the New Testament uses it and as the New Testament defines it. Let's remember that it is a descriptive term, that the Lord's Church has no proper name like your name. Each member of the church has a proper name. That's Christian. And we'll see where the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. We'll talk more about that later. But that's the name of each member of the church, each child of God. But there is no proper name for the body of the saved. 
When you look through the New Testament, you'll see it referred to as uh, the house of God, which is the church of the living God, pillar and ground of the truth, churches of Christ salute you, the body of Christ, and so on. So each one of those terms uh, highlighting something about the church and he who built it and died for it and purchased it with his blood. So I would say that's the key subject because it begins with the establishment of the Lord's church in Jerusalem. And I'll say here any church established any other time than in Jerusalem on the first Pentecost following the resurrection of Christ, Acts chapter two is not the church Jesus built. It's not the church to which he adds those he saves. That's when the church started. It's an identifying mark of the Lord's church. The terms of entrance into it are set out. Uh, it's a continuation of what was said. In fact, if you turn back to Luke chapter 24, in the last few verses, you see um, Luke's way of stating the Great Commission. We mainly refer to Matthew and Mark's statement of the Great Commission. But Luke in chapter 24 um, says in verse 46, Jesus speaking, thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And you're witnesses of these things. That's Luke's great commission. And we see that it takes up then, since he addressed Luke to Theophilus, it takes up where he left off in the continuation in um, Acts chapter 1. So it's about the church of Christ, the mission of the church, the purpose of the church, um, the worship of the church, even the persecution of the church, and the triumph of the Lord's church. Um, as there is but one Lord, then he has one church. Paul reasons that way in Ephesians 4. There as many churches acceptable to God the Father as there are only begotten sons acceptable to God the Father. We know how many that is. Seemingly, people can't uh, get that straight in their mind. But nevertheless, the Bible does, and we can read it and understand it if we want to. And that's what we have, as I'd say, the key subject. It would be the church of Christ. Characters. Uh, I guess we can call them key characters. Well, first of all, the Holy Spirit. Next of all, I'd say Peter and John, especially Peter. And then for most of the book, the Apostle Paul and the Apostles in general. And I say that because whatever Peter and John and Paul were doing, every one of the Apostles were doing in the place God directed them to do it. And that we don't hear what Matthew did. And we don't hear what uh, James the Less did. We, uh, we don't understand why God allowed James' brother John to be killed so early in the history of the church. And yet he allows the others to live a long time. We don't understand all that, but God knows. It's in his purview. He controls that. The secret things belong to God, but the things that are revealed to us and our children. So we don't concern ourselves with that. That's that was how it fit into the divine scheme of things for that time, and thus it happened. Uh, starting into the background of the book, again, the book doesn't name its, its writer who wrote it. Let's emphasize again, God wrote or authored the Bible through different human writers by the instrumentality of the Holy Spirit and how he inspired them. Uh, however, again, like we said on Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, from the earliest of times, the ancient people uh, attributed to Luke, who was the traveling companion of uh, Paul, the Apostle Paul. Uh, I've mentioned, uh, if you read church history, there is a Clement of Rome who lived in the first century, but this Clement that I'm about to mention was Clement of Alexandria, who lives from, from about 150 to 220 AD. And he said, as Luke in the Acts of the Apostle relates, and that's a quote. So they were considering Luke to be the physician and companion of Paul, the writer of this. 
Uh, of course, if you consult the modernists and uh, liberals, they have always tried to challenge Luke as the writer. But if you consider, and we won't be able to do a lot of that, but we will do some of it, the internal evidence, the evidence within the book of Acts, then it points to Luke. First of all, he dedicated it to Theophilus, as he did in his uh, writing about the gospel. When you look at the vocabulary in the Greek language, and even his style, you'll see the two books are very similar. Uh, for those of us who deal somewhat with different writers, Ken and Sonia will particularly appreciate this, when it comes to those who write for contending for the faith, or more especially those who have written over the years for our lectureship books, then if you get many articles from them or many manuscripts from them and you read after them, you'll see they all have a style. Now, sometimes we might wish they would change their style somewhat, but nevertheless, and that's true of anybody. Anybody has a style. If you study them enough, you'll, you'll figure out uh, their style. So that's another reason that we conclude that Luke wrote the book of Acts. Again, he was a physician. He was a trained, highly educated man as a physician. I made some comments back that when we were talking about the book of Luke, that their uh, medical training was very high that in fact they lost a lot of that knowledge when the Roman Empire fell and through the Dark Ages they had to relearn a lot of that. But it reflects Luke's background as a physician, which Paul said he was, uh, referred to Colossians 4.14. The author's use of we, we in discussing Paul's preaching trips is what tells us that he was Paul's traveling companion in those, at least for a good part of them. Uh, Acts chapter 16, verse 10, and Acts chapter 25 through 15. Um, we know from the book of uh, Luke that he did very careful research before putting his information into print. Luke 1, 1 through 32, you may remember that I pointed out that some scholars had noted that he was one of the most careful historians they had studied from ancient times. He had an excellent opportunity to gather firsthand information for his book. That's another point. It's always important if you are a historian and have studied history and taken classes and, and how to try to be as accurate as you can about things that happened in the past. And they have certain guidelines they teach you what to look for and how to do it. And he had those qualities about him. I was noticing doing some reading in uh, the Greek historian Herodotus last week, I think it was, who lived before Alexander the Great came on the scene. And just reading after him, uh, he's honest to say this, but many times he'll tell this story and then he'll say, and that was the view they had, or that's the way it's come down, which is no way of being able to document anything. Of course, we were refined about that now by the training you so much how to document whatever it is that you're writing to show your sources and how to properly do all of that. So there's always the matter of being cautious, and Luke was. And he had a, he had a great uh, opportunity for firsthand information to write his book. Being a personal attendant and traveling companion of Paul for much of the time, Acts 16, 10, verses following, and uh, chapter 20, verse 5, all the way through chapter 28, verse 31, then he had this personal knowledge. You can't beat that for knowing something. I find it enjoyable to read these books uh, of people uh, who were actually on the scene and you get their observations of it. And that's what you want to try to do. 
uh, Paul would have been able to supply him with a tremendous amount of personal information about events in the life of the early church when after Paul had gotten into things and being an apostle, he could guide things and direct things. And how would you like to be with Paul and from the standpoint of being able to sit down this afternoon after a hard day of preaching and tent making and just sit down and discuss things? Uh, we must, let me pause here and emphasize this. <clears throat> it's very easy for anybody reading about any history or the life of anybody, a biography, autobiography, especially uh, history. Uh, let's just take um, World War II. You'll read about Japanese bombing of Pearl Harbor. Or if you, which got America into the war. Or if you're maybe a little more knowledgeable of European things, you'll realize World War II officially started with the invasion of Germany invasion of Poland by Hitler and the Germans in September of 1939. Well, it's very easy to fail to realize from September 1939 to December of 1941 is, is a long time. And then after we entered the war in uh, December of 41, anybody know when America made its first effort to invade in the South Pacific, how long it was after World War II that we made an invasion. I didn't say fight the Japanese, but to make an invasion, to take an island and to stop their, their um, continual expansion. Anybody have any idea? Ken, I'll, you're the most likely one, I think, to have an idea. It's in mid-42 uh, when they invaded Guadalcanal. Guadalcanal in August of 42. Well, now, what all was going on in the lives of the troops between December and August? That's a lot of days. Uh, just think about what all has gone on since last December in your life down to right now. So we, we read this in the Bible. And if we don't watch out, we'll read through the book of Acts. Remember, it's a historical book, inspired though it is, still historical. We cover from about 30 AD to roughly 60, 62, really, somewhere, maybe 63 AD. And it's easy to hit these spots. And uh, you can even memorize it like in Acts 1, you could call it preparation, Acts 2, the establishment of the church, and you could go right on down the line in each chapter to help you remember what went on in the chapter to remember something about it. And yet it may have taken years or months at least between those events. So don't let that, that fool you when it comes to the historian. In this case, the Holy Spirit guided him to infallibly record what he had carefully studied and got those things from someone like Paul, as well as he knew personally Barnabas, he knew Philip, he knew Peter, he knew James, he knew John, he knew, he knew Mark, he knew all those people. And he has the Holy Spirit guiding him to infallibly select and write down perfectly the, the truth. Uh, if you look, I'll go back over here to using one hand to turn here to the beginning of some of the acts of some of the apostles you will hear him say and this again is one reason we think he wrote acts as well as luke very first verse of acts chapter one verse one the former treaties have i made O theophilus of all that jesus began both to do and teach that's the book of luke and uh, un, I did that until the day that he was taken up. After that, he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. Now, we just read some of that a while ago at the end of Luke. To whom also he showed himself alive after his passions by many infallible proofs, being seen of them 40 days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Now, he wasn't there when that happened. Where did he get the information? Well, I tell you one of them, and 
Think of all the others that would have been around that he knew. Then in verse 4, being assembled together with them, commanded them they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which, he, which saith he, you've heard of me, and so on and so forth. So where did he get that information? He got it from the people that were there. He did just like anybody writing historical treaties today. He went to his sources. But he had living sources. And, of course, we don't know how many others he may have personally known, but we can pick these out from um, the Bible itself. And he also would have personally visited many of these places. Um, that makes a big difference. You may not understand that, but um, give an example. The Battle of Shiloh, that took place not too far south where Jody grew up, not far from Henderson, Tennessee, where Freed Harmon is. And uh, when it took place, it was the biggest and most bloody battle of the Civil War at that time. And it happened in the spring of 1862. And still up to that point, somebody, they were still sort of thinking this thing will already gone on a little longer than we thought it would. We'll get it over with. But after Shiloh, they decided that this is going to be a long, drawn-out, bloodletting affair. But we got there one time, and I forgot who all was with me. But I decided that I would walk that thing out. So what I did was go back to where, of course, they got markers where it all took place, to where there was first contact made by the Confederate soldiers attacking the uh, Union troops. And you know, <laughs> this is a side event, but we get all upset because of the Japanese sneak attack on Sunday morning at Pearl Harbor. You know when the Confederates attacked the Union at Shiloh early on Sunday morning? <laughs> anyway, they did. And I walked the whole thing through, right up to where they brought the Federal troops all grouped up together on that, at the end of that first day, down on the Tennessee River and had them backed up on it. Well, now, what does that have to do with anything? Because you can see the terrain, you can see the thing, you can read from the historian, you can go through it, you can experience it. And I don't know of anybody that, uh, who cares about what happened in the past where they can go to where it actually happened that uh, that doesn't make an impact. And so Luke uh, was just as human as you are, I am. And he would have been taking note of this kind of thing carefully because of what he said, this accurate knowledge that he had. He, he was there at Antioch of Syria. He was uh, at Caesarea. And uh, he had all kinds of, he could have interviewed people outside the church just to see what they said about events that were publicly known. He had an opportunity to examine various documents that uh, were around. He was just a good historian. And if you study real good historians today, you'll find out that they do a lot of the same thing. On top of that, he had the Holy Spirit to guide him to infallibly select accurately that which had no flaw in it and record it as we know it in the book of Acts. So that's a very important point also. And there's more stuff you could see, but that just shows you the kind of man he was. Um, how much aware he was of where this book would appear in the canon when it was still very written and hadn't been pulled together in one body, I don't know. But I imagine every writer of the New Testament, because of what Paul said, that they were aware when they were writing, the Holy Spirit was guiding them. And I might mention here, there's a, different in, there's a difference in revelation and inspiration. A person may receive revelation and uh, declare it as the Holy Spirit works through him to infallibly state it, as did the apostles on the day of Pentecost. But somebody like Luke, who was not an apostle of Christ, thus did not have the baptismal measure of the Spirit, but no doubt had hands laid upon him, and thus received the gift, and I think it would be the gift of prophecy, for that was the teaching gift. That was the, uh, so the way that they received the Holy Spirit's direct guidance. 
that he would have guidance in selecting what he selected to accurately and infallibly record it. That's the difference in inspiration and revelation. Now, Paul would have had revelation being an apostle as well as inspiration. And there was revelation that had nothing to do with writing scripture. Remember Agabus? He took Paul's girdle and bound himself with it. So that's what the Jews are going to do to the man whose girdle this belongs when he goes to Jerusalem. So you had that kind of revelation that guided them at important times. But then you had the revelation of God's will, the gospel, the New Testament system that we have as the New Testament of the Bible. God's behind it all. But we need to know the difference in revelation, the unfolding of new knowledge nobody knew beforehand, and we couldn't know it without revelation. And then you have the guidance that uh, is inspiration, Theophanoustos. God breathed out, and uh, Peter said we were born along by the Holy Spirit. It wasn't of their own human powers or intellect that they selected and wrote down these things. God was behind it. As to the purposes of the author, you'll notice that uh, he wanted Theophilus to know the certainty concerning the things. That's the reason he was a careful historian, to know things certainly, to know things certainly. You know, this hurricane coming in up until just here recently, and I guess it still could make some sort of dive dough and come back at us, but they're saying now they think it's not. It's going to make its turn to the Northeast. I would like for them to have been more certain than what they could be because they did not have the wherewithal to be more certain due to the knowledge they have and lack of it of how hurricanes go. But when it comes to my soul salvation, which deals directly with Christ and the things pertaining to Christ and that are of Christ, which the church is of Christ, then I want to know the certainty concerning the things that related to the origin and history of the church that Jesus built. Luke 1, verses 3 and 4 shows us that he was that kind, as I've been spending some time on here, of a historian. Um, he was writing to, fully aware that he wanted to meet the false charges that hostile Jews made unbelieving Jews to Christianity. I think you'll see that as we go through the book. But if you read Acts um, 15, the last couple of verses of Acts 14, you'll see also that he had the Judaizing teacher in mind in these things. He wrote to show that Christianity, think about them working in the Roman Empire. Think about what we've already learned about how the Romans operate how they are lenient in a lot of ways, but they are not going to tolerate at all anything that indicates you might be a, in rebellion to the empire or a danger to the empire. So he wrote to show that Christianity deserved to be tolerated by the Roman government. The government. Uh, how did he do that? How did he approach that? Well, with that in mind, as you go through the book of Acts, you'll see that it was derived, he makes this point, it was derived from Judaism, which already had legal standing. And because it was in no way disloyal and certainly not rebellion to Rome, we get an insight into how then Christians in the Roman Empire would deal with pagans, but especially Roman authorities. You see, reasoning was involved in every case, and you have to be careful as to what you select because um, they'll find out. He cites various and numerous favorable judgments for the Lord's church and her leaders by local folks and folks in the provinces. Pilate and Herod Antipas pronounced Jesus innocent of wrongdoing. He recorded that in Luke 23, 14, 15, and 22. In the first uh, preaching tour of Paul, Sergius Paulus, who was the proconsul of Cyprus, and remember these, these folks, the Romans kept detailed records. He, um, he believed what Paul said. 
in Acts 13, 7, and 12. When you get over to Achaia and Corinth, Gallio, who was proconsul of Achaia, did not see any crime in necessarily being a Christian, Acts 18, 12 through 16. I mean, he's, he's building a pretty good case book right here. Uh, in Philippi, you'll remember that the magistrates publicly apologized for beating and imprisoning Paul and Silas, Acts 16, 35 through 39. You know, you wonder sometimes, you say Paul being kind of pushy here because they sent and said, you're going out of the city quietly. Paul said, no, they have beaten us Romans and beaten us uncondemned. Let them come in their official capacity and lead us out of jail and let us go. And you say, well, why? Why do you do that? Well, God in his infinite wisdom could very well be thinking, here is a case that can be used in defense of Christians many years to come in the Roman Empire. Uh, in Ephesus, you had people protecting Paul from the great mob that was there, chapter 19, verse 31. Uh, down in uh, Jerusalem, Claudius Lysias, in his letter, said that uh, he had nothing, there was nothing against Paul, chapter 23, verse 29. Uh, Festus, who was governor of Judea, plainly declared that Paul had done nothing worthy of death, chapter 25, verse 25. And you must remember when Paul stood up before the council in Jerusalem, but especially before Felix, then Festus, two, pro, two uh, uh, procurators, and then the king Agrippa at the time, that he even said, if I've done anything worthy of death, I refuse not to die. And they all concluded that he wasn't worthy of death. And Festus, after he, Paul had presented his material to King Agrippa, they went aside, and Festus and Agrippa declared that Paul had done uh, nothing worthy of death and that he might be released if he had an appeal to Caesar, chapter 25, 18 through 21, and verse 25, which shows that Paul's appeal to Caesar not only served to get him out of the Jews' clutches when they were only interested in killing him, but it also figured into the providential plan of God to get the gospel uh, through Paul into Rome for the purposes that we don't have a lot of details of. And when he got to Rome, because when he was there, he, he spent uh, in his own house, hired house with a Roman guard, free to receive who anybody wanted to, coming and going. How many people did he, did he teach and work with? But if he hadn't gone there, then that wouldn't have happened. The Roman government had evidently found nothing politically offensive in Paul and his message. Well, they allowed him to continue his preaching even in Rome, as I said. And that's recorded in chapter 28, verses 30 and 31. Uh, of course, you say, well, why did he, in his second imprisonment, which is not recorded, but why then did he end up being killed? Well, we don't know all the machinations that would work out. Besides that, everybody's got to die sometime. It's important that the man wants to die. And it would come the time that Paul would die. And so something had to take place. But he shows throughout his book, Luke does, that it was the unbelieving Jews. And this is very important. The unbelieving Jews who were the real antagonists, and they were the ones that stirred up the trouble. And uh, they sought prejudice and incite the Gentile population and the Roman authorities to destroy the Christians. I just finished going back through the book of Acts uh, just yesterday. And uh, again, it's amazing. I couldn't tell you how many times I've gone through it just to, to read it with the idea of, of Luke presenting this to be around for a long time for the benefit of Christians to be able to use it in defense of themselves in view of what would try to be used against them by unbelieving Jews. Now, of course, after Paul's death, which we think was 64, somewhere along there, maybe 65, uh, five years later, there was no Jewish state. There was no temple and chief priest to guide synagogues throughout the Roman Empire. And it was at that time that secular history records that 
Roman Empire began to be aware of the fact this is no Jewish sect. This thing stands alone. And uh, it permeated the empire. And of course, the next uh, persecutions we read of in history are those of the Roman emperors later in the century. And that's why the book of Revelation was written to persecuted Christians. Uh, and all of that was built upon uh, lies that were told about the Christians and all the things they were doing. And Jews were more than happy to get behind these pagans who had all sorts of ulterior motives to do it. Remember Demetrius and the silversmiths in Ephesus, that he called together the whole uh, group of silversmiths and said, this keeps on, there won't be any Ephesus, and if that uh, are no temple of Diana, thus there won't be a Diana, and we won't be able to make money because we make all the silver images and sell them. Well, they had no interest, what, right or wrong? or existence of God, or who he was, or anything else. But don't you think that the unbelieving Jews, in view of the record that we have, would have been gladly uh, allying with them? That's exactly what the chief priests and others did to get Jesus killed. And they even said, we have no king but Caesar. Well, they didn't like that. They didn't believe that. That was a bunch of hooey, as far as they were concerned. There was no honest bone in them. Well, also, I'll close with this. Luke had an evangelistic purpose in mind. Millions have been saved by reading the conversion accounts of the book of Acts. You have the plan of sight, or you have the Great Commission, go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. You have a record of people who believed and were baptized and were saved in the book of Acts. You also have regular non-conversions, but you have all of these who, not a, who heard what was necessary from Jesus that was to be preached to every creature that they had to believe and obey. And you see them teaching those things, starting from Acts 2, taking people where he found them. He preached the gospel, Peter did the other apostles in Acts 2, and they became believers. And the believers cried out, what shall we do? And they were told as believers, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, for the promises unto you and your children, and all them that be afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. So we see him giving the wherewithal about that. He records the spiritual growth, that is, the growth problems in the church and the growth of Christians. And he deals with the development then of individual members of the church or the congregations or the church under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And of course, we come across uh, sin in the church, the first sin in the church, and I, Sapphira, before that uh, uh, or after that, you have the first problem in the church and the neglect of the uh, Greek widows and so on. So you have all that recorded, all that written. He records for for disciples who are yet to come. He wrote for us how the church began and the great sacrifices made to bring it into existence and the oneness of it, the significance of it, and what we ought to be and the identifying marks of it. All those things set into the idea of the purpose for his writing. And maybe there were others that we have been noticed. But time's got away from us, and uh, that's where we are in our starting of the study of some of the acts of some of the apostles. It's all, uh, also been known, I mentioned this, it's been also called Acts of the Risen Christ. It's also been called by uh, Acts of the Holy Spirit. And uh, it finally settled by the second century and just being called Acts, uh, usually Acts of the Apostles. And that's the way it basically is referred to today. Are there any questions, any ideas that you have?